Hey, welcome everybody to the On The Road live show this June Saturday morning. I'm John Marucci, creator of the On The Road YouTube channel that provides RPOD and RV specific videos to help in your RV travel experience. You know, the purpose of the On The Road live show is to provide a place to interact in community, get questions answered, and stay current on RV news, trends, and resources. Of course, anyone, no matter the experience level, is welcome to participate and ask questions and interact. It's good to have you on the show today, and nice to connect with each of you live. You know, feel free to put in the chat what location you're logging in from. Also, to ask a question, just put the word QUESTION in all caps in front of your comment so we can see it. So on today's show, we'll cover some RV towing basics, starting with a couple towing questions asked by viewers. We're then going to look at some recent RV news, and in our newbie corner, segment, we'll look at a few important RV towing topics and tips. And in our spotlight segment, we'll take a closer look at the All Stays app as a great travel resource. You want to stick around for the live Q&A round where we take your RV travel related questions. So just want to say good morning to everyone. It looks like we got quite a few people on the call today, so appreciate it. Uh, morning, Jason. I know you're calling from Pennsylvania. Andrea from Ontario. I see Sandy from Michigan, fellow Michigander. Mark, good morning. Nice to see you on the chat here and several others. So let's go ahead and move on and get on to the first segment, which is the question. So the question segment of the show is about answering a question or two about a specific relevant topic. These are usually gleaned from the viewer follow-up questions from various videos. Today's questions come from two towing videos on the channel. As we go along, if the discussion spurns a question, just ask away in the chat. So here we go. The first question here is from Carlos. My wife and I went shopping for an RV here just a few weeks ago and picked up a 2012 KZ Spree Spirit, 20 foot, 3,200 pounds dry. It's a travel trailer. We have a 2015 Honda Pilot all wheel drive with a trans cooler, trailer brake, and a uh, weight distribution hitch and equalizer. We took our first trip a couple weeks ago, about a three hour drive. The Honda did well, but I can certainly tell the RPMs climbed even at the slightest steeps. I think we overpacked for the trip, adding unneeded weight. Do you think we're okay with trips under three hours? We do not need, we do not add any water to the tanks as we stay at full, uh, full hookup sites. So here's the issue. If you're towing a rather heavy small trailer at 3,200 pounds with a Honda Pilot, and this 2015 Honda Pilot has a max tow capacity of 4,500 pounds, so there's not a whole lot of margin there. And we'll get into that in more detail a little later. But really the key here for Carlos is that he packs light. He's got to go with less gear because really the 3,200 pounds unloaded weight isn't the true weight of the trailer. There's probably some accessories air conditioning, maybe a, a convection microwave that's going to add weight to the trailer besides his own gear. So you got to keep the trailer weight to a minimum. You also need to make sure your towing level, and it may be okay for shorter trips, but you just got to watch the weight of the trailer and the weight of the pilot both. So terrain obviously comes into play. It's going to tax the pilot pretty well if you're going up a lot of hills. We have a second question here we're going to cover, and this is from Dennis. John, thanks for your comments. A question, and I may have missed it. What kind of mileage did you get while towing the trailer? Now, he's talking about my situation with the Honda Pilot, my 171, when I used to tow that. Particular long-distance runs. I have a 2016 EXL, and it has a six-speed. I'm looking for options for towing. Uh, we're planning a cross-country trip. Not so sure with the pandemic. Thank you. So here's a situation where we have a question about MPG. Now, I haven't covered this too much. I covered it a little bit in some of the topics, but when I towed with my Honda Pilot, basically, I got about 24 miles per gallon with the Honda Pilot when I wasn't towing on the highway. Now, that 24 miles per gallon went down to about 10 miles per gallon when towing my 171. Now, remember, the RPOD 171 is pretty small. It only comes in about 2,400 pounds when you add accessories. And remember this, that speed makes a huge difference when you're talking about miles per gallon. If you're one who wants to go fast, you know, 68 to 70 miles an hour towing, you're going to get a pretty good hit on MPG. However, if you keep it lower, around 60 or so, you're going to probably see your best gas mileage. So things also like the quality of gas, headwinds, hills, they all have an effect on your MPG. And of course, like always, try to keep your trailer weight to a minimum. So let's just hop over to the chat for a moment. 
and see if we have any questions on towing. So if you have a question, just remember to put all caps question in front. If anyone has a question, follow up question on towing. Um, anything out there? Let's have a quick look. Okay, I don't see anything. We're going to cover more about towing in just a minute, by the way, as we get into the newbie corner. But first, let's go to RV News. So in the RV News today, you know, the news segment's all about uh, getting up to speed on recent RV news that may impact you. We look at various sources and try, try to boil down the news to a few main items to review. So feel free to ask questions or comments as we go along here. So first of all, just understand, and I think you guys are all aware of this, we talked about this on the last show, that traditional forms of travel continue to be hit hard. Now on the screen is the TSA checkpoint numbers for the weeks uh, prior, including May 28th through June 3rd. Right now we're showing about a 13% volume year over year, meaning that we're only people are only flying at about 13% of the volume of last year. And this is a slow increase from 8% from four weeks ago. So four weeks ago we only had an 8% of the total versus now 13, so it's growing a little bit. Air travel is recovering very slowly. We've had 16.8 million people travel this last week in 2019 compared to only 2.2 million this year, the same week. Uh, we learned last show that 94% of people still plan to vacation in 2020, which likely means more vacations by car and RV. Meanwhile, new and used inventory on RV Trader continues to decline. So this is just proving the point here. There's been just under a 10% decline of uh, available new and used trailers on RV Trader from 156,000 down to 40, 142,000 in the last couple of weeks. So this is a really important indicator that people are buying RVs. And I think most of you see this happening if you're following on the forums at all. While there are plenty of RVs still available, the drop shows an increase in demand. Now, one uh, repercussion of this is Thor. If you don't know about Thor, they make Airstream and Keystone. Some of the uh, they're some of the larger, uh, the largest producer of RVs in North America with about 50% market share. They reported we reported on the last show that they're seeing a spike, and Thor's increasing production. They showed this week in the news at some of their facilities because they're seeing higher than experienced demand uh, coming back into the marketplace. Now, Bob Martin of Thor has a quote here. In addition to providing a personal space that allows people to maintain social distance in a safe manner, you know, the RV life also allows people to connect with loved ones, provide the ability to get away for short, frequent breaks or longer adventures, and helps people reconnect to nature or explore some of the many attractions that are often just a drive away. And that was from RV News on May 29th. So very important. That's one of the leaders of the industry is seeing this trend. Now, in conjunction with that, we talked about Campendium as a resource on the last show. Campendium has open statuses, and this status is as of uh, June 4th here, that 18, only 18 out of 50 state park campground systems are currently closed. That means most have reopened. But some have still delayed opening or are only open to residents. Those include places like California, Michigan, um, Oregon, and Wyoming. Some of the larger campsite areas and states are still closed uh, during the month here and should be reopening. So as of the 4th of June, 19% of U.S.-based campsites listed on Campendium are closed, and that's down from 46%. So we're seeing a lot of campgrounds reopen. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit here about another piece of news, which is interesting. Just this last uh, week and a half or so, Leisure Travel Van, and what we're going to show here on the screen here is a little walkthrough of the travel van. This just came out. It's the Leisure, Leisure Travel Van Wonder uh, rear, uh, rear lounge uh, lay, layout here, and it's on the brand new Ford... Tr transit chassis, chassis, excuse me, <clears throat> and it allows for the swivel seats in the front. So you look at here, one of the main things here is the Murphy bed in the back. It actually folds out from a nice couch area. So this is on the Leisure Travel Van site. You can look at it at your own uh, time here, but this has a lot of versatility in the back. The thing I really like about this is the different areas of the travel van and how you can use them. Here's the front area that you can have uh, tables that stand up. Again, it's on the brand new 2021 Ford uh, Transit chassis that just came out. You can swivel the captain's chairs back to actually include those into the conversation. So if you look at the virtual tour here, which is pretty interesting, I like doing this once in a while because you can easily see what's going on when you do a virtual tour. And let me just get this straight for you for a second here. Uh, again, looking at the lounge area in the back. So you notice you have kind of a full couch area 
And as we go forward, really nice colors. It reminds me of a flying cloud in an Airstream. A nice large refrigerator, both freezer and, and uh, fridge area, and a microwave above. Look at all the light back there. That's really nice too, as far as letting a lot of light in. Let's just click up front here for a second. And you can look at the kitchen area, solid surfaces, really nice kitchen area. So a lot of window space. If you don't notice lately, that's one of the trends in RVs. They're adding a lot more light, which is fantastic. So this is the leisure travel van. Let me just click through to a couple photos here. One second here, one more time. And we'll just, uh, you can look at the, the versatility of the back here. Let me just click on a couple photos here and you'll see it closer with me. But the configuration capability on the back of this is is really quite nice. Let me just scroll down here and you can see a different different ways to actually lay out the back lounge including like these recliners down here kind of cool and uh, again the windows light just wonderful having a lot of light and then let's go back down here obviously it folds out to a nice size bed at night so you can use that and I think uh, we will call that good. Let's just, I think we're going to one more. Let me just look at one more thing here real quick. Okay. All right. So that just came out on May 22nd. Pretty neat. The next thing we want to look at news. I talked about this at the last show. We talked briefly about the new Keystone Hyperdeck flooring, which is water resistant. Now I first saw this in a video about 18 months ago where Keystone demonstrated it at a trade show by having little pieces of the floor actually floating in water without uh, absorb, absorbing any moisture at all. Now, just to let you know, I really think this is a game changer for the industry, and hopefully this will uh, kind of flow into other manufacturers. But it's currently in the Keystone Bullet and Premier travel trailers, this Hyperdeck, and it is water resistant. So if you look on the screen with me, this is made of inorganic, uh, inorganic water resistant material. It's fiberglass reinforced layers, increase strength and prevent soft spots. And if if you follow travel trailers or if you have one or have had one for a while, you know that the floors are probably one of the biggest issues that you end up with. You've really got to be careful with leaks and water on the floors because you can have a lot of problems. So this hyperdeck flooring, in my opinion, is a really big deal. You notice here that, and this is similar on most uh, light travel trailers, ultralights, they have Luan board with styrofoam sandwiched in between it. So if you look at like your R-Pod and, you know, pull the plate off underneath the shower, you can see a little cutout for the drain and you'll see this. Well, in the Keystones, it's different material now and it's going to be water resistant. So it's a big deal. This high den density foam is going to make it also lighter. So that's also important. If you can make the floor lighter, that means you can add weight in other areas and, and produce maybe a more solid travel trailer. So that's a bit of news there. And let's just take, you know, my take on all this for, for the news is June, by the way, is likely to be, you know, back to camping month. Almost all state parks should be open by the end of June for overnight reservations, given some social distancing restrictions. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out with so many people buying RVs just now. Some places will restrict bathhouse usage, so you'll want to be aware of that and plan on using your RV bathroom just in case. And likely this will curtail some tent and like trailer camping as well. And if you plan to hit a campsite this month, you know, feel free to let us know in the chat where you're planning on going. Okay, so let's see if we have any chat questions. Okay, here we are. Let's see, we do have... Okay, Mark. Hi, everyone. Uh, the cornice over my back window fell from my R-Pod wall. It was mounted too. Uh, any suggestions on a stronger way to remount it? And that's a, that's a tough question, Mark, because as you probably know, the walls on the R-Pod are pretty thin. So I think you probably have to, you know, try to remount it in a, diff a slightly different location from the original holes. I think you probably can, you know, I'm just thinking about off the top of my head what you may be able to use in there. You might be able to patch it a little bit and remount it. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else is in the chat has, has done something like this, like put some sort of material there to mount it to. I'm not sure. I haven't done it before. I've had, I've never had one fall off. I have had to have the uh, screens replaced, but I haven't had one fall off. So feel free if you have any input from Mark to, to put it in the chat. Okay, let's see. All right, we also have a question from Nathan. How fast can you get up to comfortably towing with your Tundra? Just picked up a 2020 GMC Sierra SLT 4x4 with a 5.3, and I'm curious how it will hold up at speed. So I'm, I'm guessing here, uh, Nathan, that you're talking about um, getting up to speed 
as far as actually when you're driving getting up to speed or are you talking about just uh, understanding how to use it? So maybe I could use some, uh, use some clarification on that one. So feel free to clarify. If you're talking about just getting up to speed with learning how to tow, I mean, I think that's just this process and we're gonna go over a few things right now, but with the Tundra, it's just not very difficult towing like an R-Pod. Uh, it has plenty of capacity, so it's a matter of you know, hooking it up properly and, and getting out and going and just understanding some safety features around that. We'll talk about a few things in just a minute. If you're talking about actually driving it, like getting up to speed, you know, your GMC shouldn't have any issue at all as far as towing uh, a lighter travel trailer. So Nathan, feel free to comment more if you have any, any, more, um, any more insight on your question there. Okay, we have more. A question from Terry, looking at a 2020 179, what difference is there with the Hood River uh, for a non-Hood River? So that's a good question, Terry. The Hood River actually rides a little higher, uh, made a little bit more for off-road use, including uh, the nubby tires, uh, kind of more robust tires for off-road, but it does ride a bit higher. Uh, the non-Hood River are riding lower. They don't have, they more have road tires than off-road tires. And there's probably a couple other things that I can't remember. Those are the two big things that come to mind. Uh, they may have a, a little bit different on the utilities, but I don't think there's much difference other than the ride height and the tires. Now, I may be missing a couple things, so feel free to comment in the chat if anyone else can remember some of the differences. So thanks, Terry, for that. Got another question. Okay, uh, we have a 2020-190 with two 12-volt batteries. If boondocking for 48 hours, would you recommend using propane for the fridge to save battery? or battery for the fridge to say propane. I would use propane. So if you're boondocking, I think what I would do is I'd use propane for the fridge and generally, you know, even, and also like to heat the hot water. If you're not plugged in, obviously you can't plug in the electric element to the hot water heater. So you're gonna to wanna to use propane to the fridge. You're gonna to wanna to use propane generally and, and stay away from the electric. Now, one thing you can do, if you don't wanna do a mod on your tongue and add a second propane tank, you can just bring one with you. And I've done that uh, when I've toted the R-Pod with my truck, I brought a second propane tank. It, the nice thing about that is, is if one runs out, you can change it out and then go fill one up rather than just bringing one. The other thing people do is they do a mod on the tongue and they actually put two propane tanks on the tongue. So that helps a lot too. So you may want to think about that. So thanks for that question. Great question on, on boondocking. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's see if there's any, any other questions just going through. There's another one down a little bit. A couple down from that. Yep, let me look here. Okay. Okay, also a question. Also, any advice for monitoring the propane left in the tank? Yeah, well, I have a, on the Amazon storefront, it's at amazon.com slash shop slash John uh, There is a little device I use. It's manual. It's basically a propane weigh uh, item. You just use it and you, you know, you hold the propane tank up and it'll tell you how full it is. You know, you can put things on the tank, but I just like the old school method of weighing it and tell real easily how full the propane tank is. That means you do have to disconnect it to weigh it, by the way. So just be aware of that. But I think that works really well and has worked well for me. You can just go to the shop and find that. That'll be under, uh, I think, some of the tools for our pot. So okay, let's see if we have anything else up. There's another one below. Let me just click down. Okay. 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 Uh, Colin, do you have any tips for R-Pod solar ready? Okay, so I haven't used solar specifically. I know in my 179, 2017 179, I do have a solar ready plug and there is a Zamp uh, kind of suitcase solar panel you can buy to plug right into that. And I haven't done that yet because I haven't done a lot of boondocking, but I think you can get a Zamp. I would just, Colin, I'd look up on Amazon on for Zamp and there's like a suitcase, it actually unfolds and you can set it out. It has a regulator and the whole thing and you can plug that right into your SAMP ready uh, ports and that'll charge your battery. So that's one way to go. Otherwise, you're really looking at a custom job where you're putting solar panels on the roof and having to wire it and that's a, a lot more intensive and probably more expensive. So just be aware of that. But there's a way to do that. They actually put the solar on the side in a lot of the models that you can plug in a solar panel on the side. So thanks for that question, Colin. We got some more. So let's see here, Andrea. Uh, is is exterior UV protection necessary? If so, what products do you recommend? Okay, so, um, you know, I just used the new um, new finish uh, polishing compound on my, uh, on my R-Pod. I don't know if it's polishing compound. It's kind of a wax, but it's not a, really a wax. But new finish I've used for years and have had great success. Now, I'm, I've just, believe it or not, I just dewinterized my 179. And I it's been out 
you know, in storage for about seven months because I, I took my Keystone Bullet down to Florida this winter. So I took it back to the house. It's been in storage without a cover for seven months and it looks fantastic still. Now, mind you, Michigan winters, they don't have a lot of sun. So if you're in a very high sun area, you know, you may want to think about a cover. But for me, the new finish has done fantastic in terms of protecting the finish of the fiberglass of the R-Pod. So that's what I recommend. Uh, there's obviously a lot of other products you can ask on the various forums and people use various things. I've had a lot of success with the new finish. Okay, let's see if there's any other questions before we move on. Okay, another one. Uh, question, any advice for first time camping with a 2020-190 in the rain, particularly managing the slide out? Okay, so the biggest thing I'd say about camping in the rain, and I've done this many times, and you guys probably know the 179 has a decent sized slide out, is when you level side to side when you get to your site, Make sure you put the non-slide outside, in other words, the door side usually, a little, just a little bit higher than the slide side. Because if you don't, if you do it the other way, then water is going to come onto the slide and roll toward the cabin, and you don't want that. So I try to remember when I'm, the first thing I do after chalking, by the way, is leveling side to side. So I, actually before chalking, what you want to do is you're backing into your campsite. You're trying to find a level space so that you're not off level side to side. If you have to, you put risers or links levelers down on one side, but you want to get the non-slide outside a little bit higher than the slide outside so water rolls away on the slide away from the cabin. Because if you don't, you're going to have water rolling toward the cabin and more likely to seep into the cabin. Really good uh, newbie tip there that when you're done, one of the first things you do is try and level side to side is make sure you're just a touch higher on the non-slide outside. Hopefully that helped for that. Okay. Uh, Ted, hi John, any experience with towing our pods with Toyota Tacoma with the tow package? Now, I've gone from a Pilot to a Toyota Tundra. Now, a lot of people tow with a, a Toyota Tacoma. And I think the Tacoma, if I remember right, uh, Ted, has about a 7,000 7, or 7,500 pound towing capacity, which should be plenty for a light travel trailer. So, if it has a tow package, that means it should have the, um, the uh, better trans cooler. So you shouldn't really have a problem. It's just a matter, and we'll talk about this in a second in Newbie Corner, about understanding your unloaded weights and your tow capacity for that Tacoma. But a lot of people tow with Tacomas. I think they're great trucks, and uh, you probably shouldn't have a problem, depending on what you want for a trailer right now. If it's an R-Pod, uh, you want to get one of the larger R-Pods. You may, you may have a little less margin to tow with, but a smaller or medium-sized R-Pod, probably not a problem at all. Okay, let's see if we have a couple other questions. Then we need to jump over to Newbie Corner here for a minute. Okay, with high demand for uh, trailers and RVs, uh, do travel trailer sales sizzle down in the fall? That's a good question. Uh, we, it may, right? I mean, there may be the remnants of uh, economic issues from the pandemic, and everyone's trying to get a travel trailer right now to do their summer travel and maybe early fall, but what's going to happen in the fall? I mean, I guess your guess is as good as mine, really. It could mean that it's, it starts to come down, and if you really want to wait, and don't go out, you know, don't go with a trailer this this summer and wait and see if deals come on. It's kind of a risk, I think. I think, you know, dealers are always going to want to sell travel trailers. So the time isn't always bad. Now, right now, it may be a little more difficult to actually negotiate. But um, let's, uh, I'm going to have to cut it short on the questions. Great questions, by the way, folks. Let me go ahead to Newbie Corner because there's some important towing stuff we're going to get to here. So Newbie Corner is a segment really for new folks it's covering a topic focused on helping those just getting started out. There are a bunch of people in this category right now, by the way. And if you're new, feel free to let us know in the chat if you want to. And ask questions, obviously. Today we're going to be talking about towing some more. So here's some towing basics. And let's look at terminology with towing. So just so you're aware of some of the basic terminology, UVW is unloaded vehicle weight. Now this is probably what you're going to see on a sticker, I mean on a brochure, like on a website of what the, the trailer weights on, you know, what it weighs unloaded. Now be careful with that, we'll talk about it in a minute. CCC is cargo carrying capacity based on that unloaded weight, like how much the manufacturer is saying you should be able to carry in the trailer. And gross vehicle weight is if you add those two together. So if you add a 2,500 pound unloaded weight plus 500 pounds in carrying capacity, you're talking about a 3,000 pound gross vehicle weight. Very important to understand that when you're tra talking about trying to marry a trailer with a tow vehicle. So one thing to be aware of is the brochure will say one thing and yet your sticker on the actual RV will usually say another. So an example here is when I actually bought my, uh, uh, my uh, 
RPOD 171 is quite a bit different. But let's look at an example of actually towing so this makes sense, these three different measurements. And we're gonna look at the Honda Pilot that I used in t that I used with my 171. So the 2014 Honda Pilot four-wheel drive had a capacity of 4,500 pounds. Now that, by the way, is with two people at 150 pounds each. We'll look at that in a second. It goes way down to 4,100 pounds if you add a couple more people and more gear. So be aware of that. The tow capacity of your vehicle may not be the real tow capacity once you start loading up with people and gear. Okay, and let's look at an example of this, real world example, with a RPOD 171. So this is kind of my early example here uh, with the RPOD 171. So if you look at this, it had an unloaded weight. Now this is the brochure weight. So if you go to the website for 2016, it was only 2,200 and 24 pounds, pretty light. But remember, this does not include any options like air conditioning, a microwave convection oven, or a television. So the actual sticker weight for my unit went from 2240-24 on the brochure up to 2433. So that's a couple hundred pounds more just because of the options that we're on. Now, most travel trailers today will have things like air conditioning and, and microwaves, etc. So you gotta look at the sticker weight, not just the brochure weight. And remember, this also doesn't include things like propane tanks full or a battery on there. So you probably can add another 80 or so pounds. So in this example, for this small travel trailer, it had a, carry, a carrying capacity of uh, 775 pounds. Now for me, what I'm gonna do to try to estimate what I can tow is I'm gonna take about 50% of that for my estimate. So I'm gonna add you know, 387 pounds to the unloaded weight for battery, propane, gear, and if I do water. So really my gross vehicle weight is around 2,800 pounds. So it's, it's you know 600 pounds more <laughs> than the original brochure weight. So that's kind of more real life of what you're dealing with and you're gonna to go tow. Now the margin here is the difference between the tow vehicle and what I just put out as an example here, the gross vehicle weight. So my tow vehicle had was 4,500 pounds, but then if you add any kind of gear, it really goes down on that pilot to about 4,100 pounds. And so your, your margin here is the difference, or about 1,200 pounds, which you can deal with, but notice that your capacity used of your towing is almost 70%. Now, with this example, real life, this is what I did. Uh, it was just a marginally good experience when it was heavy winds, did not like towing it, right? So it was kind of tough. And I actually, this is one of the reasons why I upgraded my travel, uh, my tow vehicle to the Toyota Tundra, because I just didn't like it that much towing the Pilot and the 171. So just be aware of that. It's not just the numbers that you're seeing or that the dealer shows you, you see in a brochure. You gotta add weight to the trailer and you gotta subtract weight from the tow vehicle. Okay, there's a couple caveats here, obviously. Depending on the RV you buy, there's gonna have different aerodynamics, depending on your terrain. Uh, and you've gotta understand, first of all, how are you gonna use the trailer? Are you just gonna go short stints to a local state park regularly? Are you plan on some cross country stuff in mountains? I mean, that makes a big difference on what kind of tow vehicle you need to be thinking about or these margins. So if it's a tight margin, but and you're gonna do a lot of traveling and a lot of hills, then just be aware it may not be the experience you're expecting. Okay, so there's some stuff on Newbie Corner. Let's just hop back to the chat for a moment and see if we have any questions on that. Looks like we might have a few. Let me just look in here. Yep, we got a question here. Uh, how often do you reseal your R-Pod roof? That's a great question. Uh, wait until it looks bad or just do it every year or two regardless. You know, that's a great question. I think there's kind of a combination answer to that. The first answer is if you see anything bad, you want to reseal it. So I've done that before. Actually, on Instagram, uh, just a couple days ago, I put out a video of my drone flying over my roof uh, at close range uh, showing the seals. And there's one place you can show see on one of the seals where I actually did some recaulking. So if you see any cracks in it or anything, you need to hit those pretty quickly because obviously you don't want any water coming in through the roof. Uh, and the second part is, you know, caulk has a lifespan. So you probably don't want to wait more than five or so years before you really start rethinking about the caulk. And it really depends on other things like is your R-Pod sitting out, you know, all winter in the sun and that caulk getting dried out and, and broken up? Or is it covered or is it in an in inside location when you store it? So there's a lot of variables. So there's not an easy answer to that. Uh, if you're in doubt, what you want to do after a few years is just take it to a, a tack and ask them to inspect and see what they think. Uh, they may have a better eye. They're looking at these things all the time. So hopefully that helped with that question. Let's see if we have anything else. Uh, any other towing questions specifically as we've been talking about towing, anybody? I think we may be, 
Okay. I think we caught that one. Yeah, I, I caught that one already. I think I hit that one already. Okay, let's go ahead and hop to the spotlight section. Okay, so the spotlight section of the show is about highlighting a specific resource so we become more informed on making decisions. Today we're going to be looking at the Allstays app, which I think is a fantastic app. Allstays has most campgrounds and places to stop along the way, like local, state, and national parks, along with private campgrounds. It also can show Walmarts that allow overnight parking. I've used them quite a bit uh, as I've traveled. You know, the Allstays app is about 10 bucks, and it's especially helpful when you need a place to stop overnight. Okay, so let's, we're going to go ahead and put on the screen here a little uh, walkthrough of the Allstays app. You can see this. This is from my iPhone. You can see I'm going to mock up a trip here. We're starting from the Kalamazoo area where I live. And we're going to go down south. So the first place I'm going to stop, I want to stop outside Louisville, just south of Louisville in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. And you'll notice these icons start showing up in the Allstays app. Now what I can do is I can actually hit the filter button here. And what I'll do is I'm going to drill into this and I'll click on independent campground. You see that independent right there because I want to find an independent campground I can stay at overnight. And it looks like this one right here is the Elizabethtown Crossings uh, Crossroads Campground. If I click on the little eye icon, the information icon, I'll notice a couple things. You can actually send the directions right to your Apple Maps or Google Maps, which is awesome while you're driving. So it can take you right to it. There's also information that below this in, in terms of like how many sites there are, how long they're open, you know, uh, max length of RV, etc. whether they have full hookups or not. So a lot of great information in the Allstays app when you want to kind of scope a place out. There's also reviews. But you know, when we we're going down a couple winters ago, we were, there was an ice storm approaching, so we had to do a little longer haul the first day instead of the 300 or so miles, 311 from the house there. So we had to keep going south. And we use the Allstays app to kind of go south and find some things, maybe farther down in Kentucky. And so there's some more uh, independent uh, places down here. There's a Diamond Caverns Resort area we looked at uh, right outside Mammoth Cave. So there's several of them you can see are independent places to stay overnight. But, you know, one of the things we found from the weather was actually the ice storm was going to come farther south. So we had to keep going. So I used the Allstays app. I clicked a few more things. I looked at, you know, Walmarts ask to park so you can have some Walmarts you can park overnight if you ask and I started going down farther south there's a Walmart you know that was just on the border but I kind of wanted to get into Tennessee because of the weather so there's a couple places to stop north of Nashville and it ended up being a really long travel day and we ended up at the Grand Ole RV Resort just north of Nashville I looked at this put it on Google Maps and was able to go right there Click on a few other things uh, in the filters here just to see what there was. If you notice as I scroll down, there's a lot of cool things in here like low clearance warnings, uh, various rest stops. So, you know, it's a longer trip that day. So we wanted to find out where there are places to stop along the way on I-65 there, as well as places, big box stores here like, you know, Cracker Barrel actually has some overnight uh, camping. Cabela's has some overnight camping. So I just wanted to check some other things that we could find out on the map, as well as uh, LP Supply, if you saw there. So this is where I ended up with, you know, there's actually a Cracker Barrel down here we clicked on. And so there's a lot of different things in this app, and that's that's the review of it. But feel free to look out on the App Store. It's 10 bucks, but it's really worth it if you're going to be doing some traveling. So there's the spotlight. Let's hop back to the uh, chat for just a second, see if anyone has any more questions before we go on in the Q&A. And I'm not seeing anything right now. Let me just double check here. Oh, we do have a question. Okay, good question here, Colin. On long road trips with RPOD, is it good to take breaks and let the tow vehicle rest? Well, I think the question has to do with the, you know, the quality of your tow vehicle. I think a truck like a Toyota Tundra that I have, it's not a big deal because the difference in the margin between what the Toyota Tundra can tow, which is close to 10,000 pounds, and my 179 loaded, which is going to be in the low 3,000 pounds, it's just not taxing the Tundra that much. Now, on the other hand, if you have a really sh small margin, like, like I mentioned earlier, the Honda Pilot with, say, a 171 or maybe a slightly larger uh, uh, travel trailer, you may have a problem with uh, taxing the vehicle a little much. That's why it's always good to have more margin than less. And if that's the case and you're using a Pilot, for example, in a, a heavier trailer, something in the 3,000 pound range, you might want to really limit the distance you're going or the distance you're going each day. So that's a great question. Uh, you got to kind of, it kind of depends. You got to kind of play, play with it as far as how you feel about how the vehicle's doing. Give it a break if you think it's, it's getting bad. Now, 
You should have a tow package on your, your SUV if you're using an SUV, which has a transmission cooler and can keep the, the uh, engine and the transmission cool while you're towing. If you're having problems, you probably don't have a strong enough tow vehicle. Okay, really good question here. Let's just see if we have a couple other questions. And you know, with that, we're actually just gonna go ahead and go into the open Q&A and have uh, open questions. It's our final segment of the show, so you can ask anything. Just put a question in all caps in the chat, and we'll try to cover anything else. Let's just see if we have um, any other questions here. Um, just Yeah, just put questions in all caps. Uh, give it a, a minute here or so. If you have any questions, we can uh, cover anything. It doesn't have to be about towing. It looks like, uh, Sandy, I see something there about the, the UP. Let's just see, planning on a camping. Okay, let's just put that up for a second here. Sandy, say, planning on, a camp, on camping in the Michigan UP at Pete's Lake National or uh, Coal Lake National. Our cabin is an hour away, so if we can get a site, we will just go there. Uh, that's that's a you know the UP of Michigan's beautiful. If, if those of you who haven't been there, it's absolutely beautiful. Now we were up there at, at the falls there uh, at the state park uh, a year a couple years ago, but we went in July. So just be aware if you're going to the UP in the middle of summer, there are a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, we had a, I'm glad we had a thermocell that kept the mosquitoes out of the tent, but got bit a lot. So if you're going to go up midsummer, just make sure you're aware, have bug spray or have some contingencies. But we had a bunch of mosquito issues in July. And I understand the UP, if you go a little later in the summer, uh, mid-August or a little later, if you can swing it at that time of year, it may be a little better. But our situation was bug-ridden. <laughs> Not that the UP is beautiful, but it was a hindrance to hiking and stuff. But nice to hear, Sandy. Hopefully you have a great time up there. Uh, UP is beautiful. Let's see here. We've got another one coming up here. Let's see. Uh, Zach, I'm considering a 193. Uh, uh, 2011 pilot will be enough to tow. That's going to be a tough call. You know, the 193, Zach, is pushing 3,000 pounds unloaded. That 2011 pilot's only going to have 4,500 pounds if it's a four-wheel drive. So you run into the situation we just talked about where the pilot only has 4,500 pounds, you know, minus gear. The uh, 193 is going to not be light at 3,000 plus pounds plus gear. So your margin is going to be pretty low. Zach, you may want to do that calculation we talked about where you add, you know, some, some weight to the trailer to take away some tow capacity from the pilot. See if you feel comfortable with it. Uh, you're also going to want to watch your distances there because remember the pilot as a good SUV. I love the pilot as a, a vehicle. It really wasn't made for towing. Uh, specifically. So if you're going to go longer term, you may want to think about upgrading that tow vehicle. So thanks, Zach. Great question. Uh, looks like we have something from Wendy here. Uh, we're camping for the first time with the 179. Well, congratulations. I love the 179. Put in outside spray hose by removable stove area. Um, not sure how to get it off. We'll, will it pull out once we shut off the water and drain? Okay, let me try to understand that question, Wendy, real quick. Put in an outside spray hose by the removable stove area. So I'm not sure a removable stove area in the in the RPOD 179. If you're talking about the hot water heater, no, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Um, let's see, uh, Wendy, maybe you can give me made, uh, just a little more detail to try and cover that one. I'm not sure I'm following totally on that. Let's hop to another question. Wendy, feel free to just put some more detail in the, in the chat, and I'll try to get back to you. Okay, Deborah, how do you get access to the roof of a fiberglass trailer? <laughs> Great question. You know, I have a 10-foot ladder, uh, and that's about what you need to get up there. Now, you got to be obviously very careful if you're using a 10-foot ladder, so I just give you that warning. But I do have a 10-foot ladder, uh, and I use that. I don't lean up a ladder against the R-Pod. It's actually one of the A-frame ladders. You know, you stand it up, and it goes out. But it is 10-foot tall, and you can get up and inspect the roof. Now, the R-Pod roofs are not made to stand on. So if you really have to do work up on the roof, you're going to want to take it in to someone who sells R-Pods and a tech, because they'll have a way to get up there a lot better. So I'd really recommend not going up on the roof of any fiberglass uh, trailer, especially in our pod. Now, the the obvious uh, exemptions to this is if it already is a larger trailer that has a ladder that says, "Hey, it's it's you know, the roof is uh, classified that you can walk on it." But if it's an R pod, you're not going to want to do that on the fiberglass ones, at least. Okay, good question, uh, Jason. Uh, tips on verifying uh, ball is in. I lift bumper up a bit. Had a boat come off uh, one time. 
Okay, so I think that you're talking about safety there, Jason, as far as just making sure that when you're connected to the trailer that uh, you might want to try and lift it up to make sure it's actually in there. And you're talking about connecting the trailer to the ball hitch of the back of your, uh, your tow vehicle. Very important that that's locked down right. Make sure you have your safety chains on. Uh, there's a whole process that you need to go through in order to hook it up safely, but good point there. Okay, another question here. Have you looked at the 2020 RPOD 179? What sort of differences you have noticed compared to your 2017? So yeah, the, the newer RPODs have one thing that I noticed that's really nice is the back windows are different. So mine has the classic flat back window on a curved back, which for some people is they've been having, you know, they've had leak problems because of that because the, the back is actually curved, but the window's flat. Now I've never had any leak issues. It's sealed really well. But now you have a slightly curved and larger back window, which is fantastic. When you're in the, in the kitchen doing dishes or cooking, it's wonderful to look outside the back of the 179. That's one of the reasons I love the 179, by the way. You know, I've backed in some really nice sites, uh, seen nature while I'm, I'm doing dishes or, you know, cooking dinner. So it's wonderful. That's one of the main things. There's also some other things RPOD added, including things like a vacuum system. Uh, and there's a few other minor things, but those are some of the main differences. The back window especially is really nice. Okay, another one. Here we go. Wendy, the 10th anniversary edition has a removable propane stove. Okay, great point there. And that's one thing, obviously, that answered the last question. There's a removable propane stove for the new 179 and a spray hose. We put the spray hose in, wondering how to get it out. So it's probably one of those connections where, you know, you have to pull the sleeve and cook it in and then it's stuck in there. Really, it, sometimes it can be really tough to, to pull back out and pull out, but that's generally what you have to do. You have to pull the sleeve away and then pull the hose off. Now, one of the things you might want to do, it's pressurized probably, right? So it has water in there. You may want to turn your water pump off, right? Or, or turn the city water off for a moment and get any pressure by releasing the water pressure from the nozzle first. It's probably under high pressure and that's why you're not be able to get it off. So get water out of the out of that line first, and then it should come off easier, hopefully, Wendy. So hopefully that helps. Let's see. Let's look at some other ones. Any other questions? Um, let's see here. Just scrolling up here for a minute, folks. Just a moment. Uh, I think we're I think we're doing pretty good. And, you know, we're coming up uh, toward about three-quarters of an hour of the show. So I think, you know, with that, appreciate everybody joining uh, it's been, it's been a good time again, trying to, uh, help everybody out. You know, the whole purpose of the channel, really, I wanted this channel to be something I wish I had when I, when I started out and hopefully that's what it's becoming, both the videos and the live chats. Uh, we'll try to do these, uh, uh, these live shows fairly uh, regularly this summer to help people out. I mean, you know, there's a lot of newbies out there, so uh, hopefully this towing part helped. And those of you who are joining and are going to watch this on the YouTube replay, this will be a back out on the channel for you to watch if you want to catch anything that you maybe missed or, or, uh, or want to follow up on. So that'll do it for today's show. Thanks for joining the live show and thanks for watching the YouTube replay. If you haven't already subscribed, we'd love to have you on the on the road team. You can also join us on Instagram and Twitter at John Marucci. So this is John Marucci. Stay safe and so long for now.